Thank you very much, Helen. I wonder if you've got a favorite television program. I think mine is, would I lie to you? <laughs> For anybody who's never watched it, it's basically uh, two teams and each person has to recall anecdotes or say something about themselves and the other team has to decide whether it's true what they say or false. I've really enjoyed it through the years. It's been a long time now, but I've had so much humor from it. It's given me laughter. It's really, it's been good for me to watch it. Um, the razor sharp wit of Lee Mack is in, amazing. And then the, the more offbeat, slightly intellectual humor of David Mitchell, I appreciate. And then, of course, Bob Mortimer, uh, he comes on from time to time and he, he tells the most unbelievable stories. And most of them turn out to be true. Being a frequent visitor to the dentist, um, the one I particularly remember from a little while back is when he said how he did home dentistry on the kitchen table on himself. I mean, nobody believed it was possible. Turned out to be true. So pretending to lie can often be quite fun. But what about actually telling lies in real life? I don't think many people like to be accused of lying. People don't like to be called a liar. It's not something that they they readily accept, often they'll deny that they're lying or they will soften it. They'll use a euphemism and say, well, I was only, I was only fibbing, um, I was only telling a porky. I was just being a bit economical with the truth. Um, people often use euphemisms when it comes to lying. It's surprising in a way, but it seems it's quite a sensitive issue still in our society. But we know, don't we, today, um, that telling the truth is not something that can be relied upon. I, I've never known things be so bad in terms of what is true and what isn't true. It's hard to tell what is true, isn't it, today, to be sure of it. Um, I don't know if this word was in the dictionary, but disinformation seems to be a word that you hear a lot these days, disinformation. Um, talking of television again, I was watching a program about Taiwan and China, and apparently Taiwan is being bombarded all the time by China uh, through the media and through the internet and um, in those ways with inf disinformation every day. It's getting very difficult to be sure of what is true. It's even got to such an extent that people will believe in things that are demonstrably untrue. So the Flat Earth Society is doing quite well these days, quite, quite a strong membership. And I don't know about you, but it, it's been something that's I never thought would happen in terms of incredulity, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, watching the outcome of the 2020 US presidential elections. Um, Donald Trump and his allies trying to overturn, overturn the result, claiming that there were um, massive voter and election fraud such an obvious false claim and it, be, it has become known as the, the big lie. I didn't realize that this phrase has been around for quite a long time. It seems to have originated with Adolf Hitler in his book Mein Kampf. He said that the Jews were using the technique of the big lie. They were distorting the truth to such a huge degree that no one could believe that they could possibly have made it up. He said their big lie was their claim that Germany 
had lost the First World War because of the failings of the German general, Ludendorff. So he was accusing the Jews of the big lie. Well, it wasn't much later that the Nazis came, came up with their own big lie, sort of turning tables, um, depicting Germany as a besieged country, an innocent country fighting to survive against the uh, forces against them, of Britain, um, US and Russia, with the Jews behind those international forces. When I read that, I couldn't help thinking of the chilling parallel that we, we are in today uh, with Vladimir Putin and his big lie. It's incredible, isn't it, that he's claiming that Russia is being attacked and has to defend itself against Ukraine with its Nazi leadership and against the West. So there is a lot of lying around, obviously. For Christians, uh, there is another great lie, which was totally e a totally evil distortion of the truth. I'm referring to the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, i.e. the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, said the serpent to the woman. No wonder that later on Jesus was to call the devil the father of lies. And so came the fall and death and evil entered human society and with it immediately came lying. Just start reading your Bible from the fall onwards. We have Cain being asked by God, where is your brother? And his reply is, how should I know, even though he's just murdered his brother? And then the patriarchs, the fathers of uh, the, the, na the new nation, God's new nation, Abraham and Isaac, they both lie about their wife, saying that it's not my wife, it's my sister. And then Jacob, of course, um, lying to his father, claiming to his father that he was really his brother Isaac. So there's plenty of lying in scripture. And as you go on into the New Testament, you find it there as well, most notably perhaps when Peter denies that he knows Jesus. Well, obviously we can be no, in no doubt that lying is wrong. The Bible makes that absolutely clear. In Leviticus, it says, do not lie. In Colossians, do not lie to each other. Interestingly, in the Ten Commandments, instead of you shall not lie, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you might expect you shall not lie, but it actually says, um, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, this may sound like something to avoid in a court of law, but I think it applies just as much in everyday conversation. The other day, I found myself caught up with, in some gossip with a neighbor. And talking of, about a third party, we weren't saying anything directly critical about them, but I realized I was starting to say things that I wasn't absolutely sure about things I didn't have any, any authority to say about that person. I was speaking out of turn, and there came a moment when I could have held back. It occurred to me that I shouldn't speak any more about this, but sadly, I, I yielded to temptation and uh, chatter, chattering went on. Later, I had to repent of that. 
Now, this may seem a difficult standard that's being asked of us, a high standard the, the Lord is asking of us in our everyday lives. But he does ask us to live holy lives, doesn't he? Be holy as I am holy. I'm just reminded of the shock that Jesus' hearers must have felt when he said that committing adultery in your mind was just as bad as carrying it out. So I think in just the same way, he wants us, our conversation to be pure and blameless. So we are the people to live in the truth and to speak the truth. Okay, fine. So how do we know the truth? Well, as Jesus himself declared, he is the way, he is the life, and he is the truth. We read at the beginning of John's Gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, his character, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in the same section, John refers to Jesus as the true light that gives light to every man. To know what is true, you have to look to Jesus. You have to listen to his words. As he himself said in John chapter 8, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth when you hold to my teaching. So listen and apply. Then you will know my truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. By following Jesus' commands and teaching, we will be able to live a truthful life. And we will no longer be controlled by all that is evil that comes in from outside and comes also from within ourselves. I think we also learn about the truth from the way Jesus lived his life, his behavior and his actions. They were those of a person full of grace and truth. He was totally free of everything that was not holy. He was the truth and he lived out the truth, most supremely in his crucifixion and resurrection. I think we should keep coming back to the Gospels. Um, I remember this is a very long time ago now, but when I was at Bible college, my tutor emphasized this to me. There are other things of great worth in Scripture, but the heart of the Scripture is, is the Gospels. That's where we must keep looking. We must keep coming back, listening to Jesus and seeing how he lived. The second way of knowing the truth is to ask guidance from the Holy Spirit. I, I was really surprised a few years ago when I was reading a uh, those chapters of John, chapters 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And I'd never noticed before, but he actually introduces the Spirit several times to the disciples by calling him the Spirit of Truth. John 14, verses 16, 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. Chapter 15, verse 26. When the counsellor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And then chapter 16, verse 13. For when he, the Spirit of Truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So the spirit of truth will guide us to know what is right. The only problem for me, I don't know if you have this problem, 
is knowing whether the thought I have in my mind comes from the spirit of truth or whether it comes from me myself. I often have occasions when I'm agonizing to know whether it's from him or it's from me. And I'm sorry to say that I seem to quite often choose the more comfortable option of concluding it comes from me, myself, and therefore it's not important and I can forget about it. There have been occasions when I have responded to him. Sometimes I've understood why it was right, sometimes I haven't. But I'm, as I say, I'm sad to think of the times when I haven't known it was from him. A few, a few sort of uh, guiding conclusions have come to me for my life. I'll mention them to you. They may be of no help to you. But the things that have come to me is, first of all, if the thought seems very unlikely that it came from me, if I, knowing myself, if I think, now where on earth did that thought come from? That, I couldn't have thought that thought. Then that's a clue that it's come from the spirit. Another um, conclusion I've come to also is when the thought is going to be a blessing to someone else, then it's likely that that thought has come from the spirit. And then as a general principle, um, I, I don't always apply this, but it, I have from time to time thought it's better to assume it's come from the spirit and get that wrong than the other way around, to assume it's come from me when all the time it was from him. So as our revered pastor would say, there you have it. Jesus is the truth. We hear the truth in his words and we see it in his life. And the spirit guides us to know the truth. It's as if he shines a light into the darkness of our world and into the darkness of our lives. And then we are free to know the truth. And also, of course, to be those through whom the truth may be known by others. We conclude our time of worship now by singing, Lord, the light of your love, shine, Jesus, shine. Please stand.